All right, welcome. So in this video, I want to continue in this series on graphs, um, looking at uh, the two standard techniques for traversing a graph. So say you've got a graph and you want to traverse it, meaning you want to visit uh, every node in the graph, every vertex, and do something to it. And most commonly, it's just to output it uh, or to check it for something. Uh, of course, this is a very common thing you'll do as a step in uh, many algorithms as well. Uh, we actually have two standard techniques, which uh, parallel techniques uh, for traversing trees as well. Although the technique that we focused on when we looked at trees earlier in this series uh, were depth first search techniques. So I want to start there uh, with graph. We can still use depth first search in, in a graph. Uh, the only sort of additional thing we have to do when we use a depth first search or depth first traversal in a graph. Uh, is we sort of have to keep track of where we've been before because uh, in, uh, if we just keep sort of moving to an adjacent vertex to an adjacent vertex in a tree where there's no cycles we'll always end up at a leaf um, and if we're unless we're backtracking uh, here you could get into a cycle and just sort of depth first go around and around and around in circles and never get to say where you're trying to get what that means is we want to be careful not to do that uh, and so we're going to remember where we've been. We're going to just leave a trail of breadcrumbs, basically Hansel and Gretel style, um, uh, to remind us where we've been, and then also to follow our, our way back, to find our way back when we're done. Uh, so let's go ahead and sort of simulate this now. That's all I've sort of said. I've said that verbally, that's what we're going to do. Uh, but let's sort of look at it in a little bit of pseudocode here. Uh, so we're going to start at an arbitrary vertex. I've already highlighted that one as F. That's where I'm going to start. Mark it as visited. And then repeat this step until we can backtrack no further. What do you mean backtrack? Well, that's one of these steps. Okay. So we're going to keep going until we can't backtrack any further. Um, that basically means we're back at the first vertex and we're trying to backtrack off the graph from where we started. Okay, so we're starting at our first vertex. If there's an unvisited vertex adjacent to my current vertex, then tra traverse to it and mark it as visited. So uh, adjacent to my vertex, uh, there are a bunch of vertices. All of them are unvisited, so I'll just traverse there and mark it as visited. That new vertex becomes my new current uh, vertex. Uh, if, I find, if I get myself in a corner, uh, in a place where there are no unvisited vertices, then I just backtrack back to the last location I was. Now, um, this algorithm is commonly just executed recursively, which means the way we do our backtracking is just let this instance of the recursive call end, and it will just pop it off the stack and go back to the last instance of the call I was on and finish off where I left off. And so uh, because of that, it makes depth first search very easy to implement. Um, in fact, it's a handful of lines um, recursively um, uh, and, it, and so it's usually the go-to way to uh, traverse a graph if you have no other uh, nothing else uh, to choose between your methods um, the, if you aren't going to do it recursively you maybe you don't like recursion or it's very costly in the environment you work in um, then you can of course just use your own stack in the same way that the recursive call stack is being used naturally to keep track of where we've been before um, every time you traverse, you just push the last node onto the stack. And any time it calls for you to backtrack, you just pop. So it's fairly sim simple and straightforward. Okay, let's take a look at it then. Uh, for F, I'm just going to use the simple, uh, I've sort of given them letters here uh, so I can give them priority. I'm going to pick uh, less, uh, letters that are earlier in the alphabet first. So F is going to, I'm going to assume its adjacent vertices are going to be A, G, J, K. Uh, so it'll go to A first and it'll, it'll traverse there. Uh, but now A is the, uh, now A is the current vertex. So we'll check, do, are any of my uh, adjacent vertices unvisited? Well, B and G are. Uh, although technically the way A is going to go, this is going to go B first. Are you unvisited? Yes. Okay, I'll go there. Okay, B will check its first neighbor. It'll say A, are you visited? It says yes. Go away. Okay. Um, my next neighbor is C. Uh, C, are you unvisited? No. Okay, I'll traverse there. Same thing again. B, are you visited? Yes, I've already been visited. Okay, on to D. D, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. Every time we move on, we pause that previous uh, recursive call. So D moves on to E. 
Uh, well, again, it asks C first, and then it will move on to E. I'm just assuming alphabetical order. Uh, e, S, D first, it says no, I'm visited, goes on to I. I actually asks D, have you been visited? Yes. How about you, E? Yes. Okay. How about you, N? Um, no. Okay. On to N. If N had said yes too, we were in for a backtrack, but N is still unvisited. Okay. N uh, is going to ask D. Nope. It's going to ask I. Uh, also, nope. Uh, both of them have already been visited. So I'll traverse to M. Okay. M will ask uh, D, and it will ask N. Then it will ask L and it will traverse to L. L will ask D. D says I've visited. Uh, it will ask H. And H says, come on in. Water's good. Okay. Um, H will ask B. Uh, B's already visited, so H will ask G. And sure enough, it will go to G. G will go, how about A? No, visited. B, yep, also visited. F, already visited. Okay. Uh, H, Yep, also visited. Okay, K. All right, K was unvisited. Lucky. Okay. Uh, again, K. K is going to go through the ranks. F. Yep, visited. G, visited. H, visited. J, not visited. Okay. We'll move to J. Now, J will say, again, F, are you visited? Yes. Okay. K, are you visited? Yes. Okay, I guess I'm done. Backtrack. Backtrack to K. Now K had already asked F, G, H, and J, but it hadn't asked L, so it'll ask L now. L says, no, I'm visited, so K says, I'm done. G had already asked A, B, F, and, uh, yeah, and H, because it went to K, so it had already asked K. So when K comes back and says it's done, G's already says, oh, I've run out too, so I must be done. Okay? Continuing, H had already done B and G, so now it'll ask K. No, nope. now it'll ask L. No, nope. okay, I'm done too. L had already asked D, it had asked H, but it hadn't asked K, so it asked that. No, nope. it asked M, also no, and it returns as well. M had already asked D, it had already asked uh, L, uh, but it hadn't asked N, so it'll ask N. And N will say, yeah, I've already been visited as well, so M ends. Now N, again, had asked D, had asked I. It had asked M, because that's where it traversed, so it has no other adjacent vertices. Uh, it's done. Okay. Uh, I had asked D, it had asked E, and it had traversed to N, so it's done. E had asked D and I, so it's done. D, now let's be careful, D had asked C, it had asked E, because that's where it traversed, but it had not yet asked I, N, M, or L, so it'll go, I guess it'll go I, L, M, N, all of them saying I've already visited D, and it says okay, I'm done too. C has already done B and D, so it's done. B has done A and C, but not G and H, so it'll ask G and H, and then realize it's done too. And A has only done uh, B, so it'll ask F. It says, no, I'm visited. It'll ask G. It says, no, I'm visited. Uh, and it's done. Uh, and so F, which has only gone to A, will go and say, hey, G, are you done? It says, no, I'm done. Uh, J, how about you? No, I'm done. K, how about you? No, I'm done. So F is all done. Okay, so the interesting thing here is we'll notice that uh, the actual shape that we get at the end is just a long snake. Now, what we're actually guaranteed to get at the end is a tree, uh, a spanning tree, technically. Uh, and this is a spanning tree. It's a spanning subgraph, and it is a spanning tree. But it's also a special case of a tree. It's just a snake. Um, and this is certainly true of what you're going to expect when you get depth-first search, because depth-first search and depth-first traversal is just trying to go as deep as possible. And if you have a graph, this graph is a special kind of graph in that it sort of has lots of different possible paths you can take. Uh, if you have a graph, say, like a complete graph or another one like this, then you should expect that you can take any path to the next vertex you want. Um, there's lots of options. So you end up getting a lot of snaking and not a lot of backtracking. Okay. Now, if what you actually had, uh, the graph you were trying to traverse was a tree, then of course you're going to get a tree 
as the shape that you get out, you'll have to do a lot of backtracking in a tree because the tree would end up having a lot of dead ends. Okay? This particular graph had no dead ends at all. Every vertex co is connected to at least two other ones. So the, the edge you came in on um, is, did need not be the one that you leave by. Okay, so this, this graph, again, uh, we just happen to have one particular traversal here. Of course, reordering these vertices in a different order, uh, giving them different labels might give them a different uh, traversal. Starting at a different vertex would give us a different traversal. Um, but a depth first search is just one way to traverse. Now, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the analysis in a second. But one thing I just want to maybe hint at, foreshadow at, is you'll notice that we looked at every adjacent vertex for every vertex. Okay. Um, or as we'll see in a second, it also means we looked at every edge. We were looking at edges, it seemed like. Okay. Adjacent vertices means there's an edge there. Okay. Again, I'll highlight this more when we get to the uh, discussion of analysis. Uh, before I do that, I want to look at our companion, our alternative. Uh, traversal. If you don't want to go depth first, as deep as possible, um, then you might want to go breadth first. And there's really good reasons to do that. Depth first um, is actually a lot easier to run some right sometimes. Uh, it's sort of the more intuitive, natural way to go. And so a lot of the times you want to do depth first if you have if you have a choice. Um, but every once in a while, breadth first is really the way to go. And now one of the reasons is depth first goes as deep as possible uh, right away first, depth first, right? Uh, but breadth first tries to not go the opposite of that, which is as shallow as possible, which means to try and go as broadly as possible before going any deeper into the graph. Okay. Now what that means is it, what it really kind of prioritizes is it's going to look at all of those vertices that are just one away first. Okay. One away from wherever we start. One what? One edge. Okay. And then we'll look at all of the ones that are two away and then three away. We sort of spiral out or go out in waves from where we start trying to find whatever we're looking for or just trying to reach all of the vertices if that's our goal. Now the data structure that we use in this kind of model is not a stack, it's again a companion, it's the queue. And so it's just sort of two standard ways for processing uh, elements, sort of first in first out or first in last out, right? And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to use the Q instead. So we're going to start by picking our arbitrary vertex, say F. We're going to, we're going to put in our Q. I'm going to mark it as visited. In this case, I'm going to mark, it them, mark them as visited as they go into the Q. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to repeat this until I uh, empty my Q. So I already have one in the Q. So what am I going to do? I'm going to pull something out of the Q. Okay. So I put it in. I pulled it out. Now what? Well, I'm going to take all the unvisited vertices that are adjacent to this current vertex that I've popped out, and I'm going to add those all to the queue. Okay, um, and then as I add them in, as they go in, we mark them as visited. Okay, so again, now, so we're thinking, let's just take our first run through. We're going to go in, we're going to put F in the queue, and then we're going to pop it out. Okay, I'm going to mark it as visited, and then I'm going to add all its companions into the queue, all its adjacent vertices, all its neighbors. Okay. So I've added them in. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop out the next element of the queue, which I'm going to assume I put them in an alphabetical order. So I'm going to grab A. And when I grab A, I have to add all its companions to the queue. Now I've added B. I should also add F, but it's already been visited. And I should also add G, but as we add them in, we mark them visited. So G is already in the queue. Basically, this stops us from adding something into the queue that's already in the queue. Okay. Sometimes you might add this into the queue and just skip over doubles. You can do that too. Although it's simply, it's, it's certainly simple to just mark them as visited as you go. Okay. So we, we popped out A and we added B because the other two were visited. Okay. So next up, we're going to get uh, G. This is not a priority queue. If it was a priority queue, B would sort of bump itself to the front, but this is just a straight up forward queue. We could use a priority queue here if you wanted, uh, but the labels on our vertices is nothing that we should, you know, nothing that, that we should prioritize, truthfully. Um, so we're going to go to G next. Uh, so when we pop out G again, we're going to try and add all its neighbors. A already visited, B already visited, 
uh, H has not been already visited, uh, K already visited. So only H is the only new one. Re notice here I'm remembering the edges that I added, that I used to add them in too. And that'll be sort of important in a second. Uh, okay, continuing then, uh, the next node uh, is uh, K. Actually, it looks like I got those two backwards. I probably should have done J first since I said I added them in in alphabetical order although the state of the graph doesn't change any different here. So it should technically be J, then K, where we would add L in. Okay, now J adds nothing in since all its neighbors were already visited. K adds L in. Then what's next in our cube? B. So we grab B. B will try and add its neighbors. They're all visited except for C, so we add C in. We grab H next, which none of its neighbors get added. They've already passed through the cube. Um, then we'll add L, which adds in, in D. Now, at this point, I actually want to maybe pause and notice what we've done. We've sort of went through three passes of our, or sorry, two passes of our spiral, two passes uh, uh, through these sort of uh, different levels of our graph. We did all those nodes that were one edge away from F, and then we did all the nodes that were two away from E, two away from F, and then the two nodes that are in our queue right now are the two nodes that are three away. And then once we, once we empty them out, we'll get the nodes that are four away. And so we can think of a breadth first search as sort of going in rounds or levels, however you want to think of it. Um, and in each level, we get one edge further away. Okay, so right now we're at sort of round three. We'll grab C. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot on this step. Um, I should have added M in as well, of course. Okay, well, that was an oversight. Um, well, I clicked it and it happened anyway, so uh, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, the, C, uh, the C should be our next one now. Okay, we'll pop it out and noticing we don't add anything in that case. Uh, now we'll grab the D, and when we add, grab the D, that will add the E in, uh, the I and the N, I should remember in this case, okay. Um, but now we'll grab the M, which pops out. And now, um, well, everything's gone through the queue, so it's just a matter of emptying the queue. So we grab E, we grab I, we grab N, and we're done. Now, I mentioned at the end, um, the, the edges might be meaningful. The edges are meaningful because if you want to find the shortest path back now, if you're I and you want to find the shortest path back, just backtrack along those edges that we remembered, and that's the shortest path back. Notice this path, the path back from I was four, well, I could go one, two, three, four, five, six, even. That's a much longer path um, if I go by some of the other paths. So uh, this is actually a solution. Breadth for search, uh, uh, sort of luckily, is a solution to the shortest path problem as long as we're promised one thing. Um, well, there's a couple different promises we could get, and they sort of get increasingly more general. The one promise we could give you is that there are no edge weights. All that we care about is how many edges. Or, another way of saying that is, every edge weight is, is weight 1. Or, another way of saying that is, every edge weight is a constant, the same constant, C. Or, another way of saying that is that the cost of the path is a increasing function of the number of edges. And that's sort of a weird, loose way of saying that really is just the number of edges that count. Okay. It might not be all that counts, but if it's the main thing that counts, then breadth first search is a good solution to your, uh, to your shortest path problem. So if your Google Maps problem is just how many roads you want to take, how many highways to get there, not how long the highways are, not how, how much time it takes, just how many you want to take. I only want to take one highway. Well, then you need your breadth first search solution. Okay. So continuing, I want to say both of these algorithms, I want to take a closer look and say, what about the analysis? Now for the uh, depth first search, I already mentioned that we were sort of doing this loop where we're going 
for each vertex and then we were looking at each edge when we were visiting that vertex. Well, it's the same thing here. Uh, each edge or each adjacent vertex is the same, right? Um, and, and this one's almost very explicit because we see quite clearly we've got kind of in each one of these loops we're pulling out one vertex and what are we doing to that vertex? We're grabbing all its adjacent vertices, okay? The same thing was true for our depth first search. What were we doing? Even though there was sort of recursion interrupting that as we went, for each vertex as we backtrack to it maybe more than once, uh, we were checking all of its adjacent uh, vertices to see if they were visited and if they were not visited we were traversing to them. So both of them are kind of doing a similar type of thing and so I've got a little bit of pseudocode here and I'm leaving it intentionally quite vague because these two algorithms follow this structure but there are a whole bunch of algorithms out there that follow this structure so when you see this structure you might say aha I've seen this before that's like the breadth first or the depth first and so I, I hopefully have a tool in my toolkit for my analysis and that's what the tool I want to talk about right now so let's look at this structure as I mentioned it said okay it's doing something like for each vertex v and v okay for each vertex v and v then after it's grabbed that vertex V, it says now for each of the adjacent vertices uh, U that are adjacent to V. So go grab all of the neighbors basically. So basically what we're doing is we're doing a for each vertex for its neighborhood. So we're kind of counting it all. And now the insight here, I'm again being super vague, I'm just saying do some constant amount of work. Okay, what does that mean? Well, breadth first search and depth first search did some constant amount of work. When it got to that vertex, what did it do? It either added it to the queue or it added it to the stack, basically. And in both cases, we're going to assume that that's some constant amount of work. There's a little bit of extra work going on there too, but it's a constant amount. And the reason I'm leaving this vague is we could replace that with anything else that had a constant amount of work here or for that matter we could replace it with something else that did more than a constant amount of work uh, but being sensitive uh, what we're really trying to figure out is how many iterations how many times are we going to end up doing this amount of work over here that's the thing and so here I've decided to call that constant amount of work D although if you like think of it as one uh, and in a moment uh, we're going to just factor that D out anyway so it will turn into a one Okay, now all I've done here is I've taken, taken this nested loop and turned it into a nested sum. And actually I've been very, you know, I'm, I'm not doing too much work heavy lifting here. I'm just copied uh, V out of V, sum over all the V's and V, sum over all the adjacent. So I haven't really said how big these are. We could say this is one to N. We know this one's one to N uh, if we want to call the size of the vertex set N. But we don't know how many uh, uh, vertices are adjacent to V and it changes from vertex to vertex we should expect that so in fact this sum which we want to our, our natural summation sort of analysis probably says do the inner sum first and then do the outer sum but we don't know what the inner sum really is we don't have a good expression so I am going to try and simplify the inner sum but I'll show you how I'm going to do it so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say look well, all that really matters is how this, since this is a constant here, we're going to plop it outside, right? All that matters is how many nodes there are in this sequence, how many nodes there are adjacent to V. So I'm just going to call that the size of adjacent to V. Now remember this function adjacent to V returns a set, a set of, of vertices that are adjacent to V, right? In the same way that we're summing over this set, we're summing over a set here. So this is just saying the size of that set, how many vertices are in that. And, and actually remembering that we have a name for this, we call that the degree of V. So I'm just gonna replace that with degree of V here. Okay, so what we're summing here is the sum over all the vertices of the degree of V. Now the cool thing about this is, it, is if you're trying to think of this sum, the sum of all the degrees, what you, what you need to realize that makes this really simple to see is that if you're adding up all the degrees, you're going to encounter each edge exactly once. Okay. Now, here's the, again, here's the sort of in, in, intuitive part that we need to understand. We might start by saying, I want to look at each vertex. That's what this sum is saying. It's saying, look at each vertex, grab its degree, and that, and add them all up. What's that going to be equal to, right? Well, 
the, this intuition of sort of looking at vertices makes it hard to see what the sum is going to be equal to. Instead, what we should do is look at each edge and realize that as we go, we're going to encounter each edge once on each side. Okay, so say you have an edge and it's connecting u and v. Well, when we've grabbed u down here, we'll count it once in the degree. And when we grab v down here, we'll count it once in the degree. So what that really means is the sum of all the degrees is actually equal to two times the size of the edge set. Two times because we encounter every edge twice. Okay, and again, once for each endpoint. We actually call this result, because it's useful in a lot of proofs, this proof in particular, that it is, we call this the handshaking theorem, that the sum of all the degrees in a vertex is of size two times the edge set. Now again, why is this important? Just shows up in a lot of the analyses that we do that show that the, the runtime of this, of the breadth first search and the depth first search is uh, order E. Okay, so both of our runtimes are uh, completing our analysis are order E. Now, what this means, and the reason why we wanted to do this, now let's go back and let's do a, a, a sort of more a rough, a more rough analysis of this instead. We could say here, well, what's the worst case? Well, the worst case for the number of adjacent vertices is all of them, right? The worst case is all of them are adjacent. So let's think, what's the worst kind of graph for this? This would be a complete graph, one where every edge is there. And if that's the case, the, the runtime would be order of v times v, which is order of v squared, order of n squared. Well, again, remember what did we say about our, our edge set in that earlier, in our earlier video, was that the size of the edge set for a complete graph is order n squared, order the size of the vertex set squared. So um, what, this, what this result is capturing for us is that when we have that dense graph, maybe the complete graph with all the edges, then the order of the edge set is large, like maybe v squared but maybe we had a sparse graph maybe all we had was a tree or just a simple a branch of one twig then the number of edges in, in that situation would be n minus one which would be only order of v not order of e squared or not an order of v squared sorry so we can see that there's a lot of variety between um uh the the running time, rather, of these algorithms depending on the graph. So we, we tend to resist saying, well, the worst case is v squared for complete graphs because that worst case assumes a particular kind of graph. And we don't usually like to assume that we have a complete graph. Maybe we don't. Maybe we have a tree. Maybe we have a sparse graph. So this analysis that, that I've tried to provide here is a little bit more fine-tuned saying, okay, this is dependent on the graph. If you have a graph with more edges, this will be more costly. If you have a graph with fewer edges, this will be not as costly. Okay. Now the other reason why I wanted to sort of separate this analysis out um, from the two algorithms is because it shows up again and again in other algorithms. Uh, in particular, there are two algorithms that follow this very similar structure, except um, the constant amount of work they do is not always guaranteed to be a constant amount of work, okay, um, uh, because it depends on the data structure we use. Um, but uh, here's two examples of them, Prim's algorithm and Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, Prim's algorithm uh, finds a minimum spanning tree. Dijkstra's algorithm finds a shortest path between two points. Both are very commonly applied algorithms in graph theory, and both of them have a very similar uh, structure to these searches. Although, uh, just warning, foreshadowing, the runtime is not exactly the same because, as I mentioned, this D is not a D. Okay, so uh, it's something else. We get something else there. Uh, but if you're interested in that, stay tuned because there's a future video uh, where I talk about both Prime Prim's algorithm and and Dijkstra's algorithm. So uh, please do stay tuned for that. Uh, I, that's all I wanted to say in this video about uh, traversing a graph um, and the analysis of such traversals. Um, so stay tuned. I think in my next video I'm going to talk more about graph problems. Problems we can define on graphs. Once we have a graph, what can we do with it? All right. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next video.